Today I am privileged to be addressing you, our aspiring servant leaders, our proven servant leaders, on just this topic. Before I move into servant leadership, I want to publicly thank Sister Nicole Kunze. I am very low tech, and typically when I give a presentation, overheads is about as far as I will go. But she came forward and said, you know, I'd be happy to help you with a PowerPoint. So actually, Sister Nicole gets all the credit, and I'm quite proud to think that there's a PowerPoint going on. <laughs> And then I'd like to thank Dr. Flagland, who extended the invitation to me. But I've been suspicious ever since I've been seeing the, the uh, little bit of publicity here and there, and that word legacy. And I'm thinking, what does that mean, legacy? So I finally figured out it's saying to you that I've been around here a long time. But I, 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 am, I am delighted. That phrase, servant leadership, is not our own. That phrase was coined in 1970 by a person named Robert K. Greenleaf. Now, Robert Greenleaf had been with AT&T in management for many, many years, but it was upon retirement that he looked back at his experience and he became more and more convinced that top-down leadership, CEO at the top of the pyramid, the command and control kind of leadership was no longer meeting the needs of our workforce, and it was no longer meeting the needs of our country. So in 1970, he wrote an essay, and it was entitled, The Servant as Leader. You can imagine how astonishing that was when we think about the pyramid forever being our style of leadership in this country, to come out with an essay entitled, The Servant as Leader. Here are Greenleaf's words. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve first. And then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. The difference manifests itself in the care taken by the servant first to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. There have been about 30,000 articles and books written about leadership on that topic of leadership in this past century. So I'm guessing about as many definitions of leadership. A one I remember reading by Max Dupree said that leadership is serious meddling in other people's lives. And I thought, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> let's hope it's service, huh? Uh, but if you think about the world we live in today, um, fierce global maneuvering going on for finite resources, more and more we're recognizing there isn't enough oil, there isn't enough water, and we have a world of people who have very, very severe needs. Also, what else is going on? A kind of squandering of trust in certain folks who are the leaders, the CEOs of our businesses and industries. So it seems to me that principles of servant leadership may be even more important today than they were in the time of Robert Greenleaf. I mentioned lots of books on leadership. There's a name that we know, James C. Hunter. Mr. Hunter has been on our campus. He was part of our Convo series, early, uh, series earlier this year. Uh, many of you, I think, know the book, The Servant, and I'm going, going to be referring to this book this morning from time to time. I very much like his definition of leadership, so I bring that forward uh, this morning. He talks about leadership as the skill of influencing people, the skill of influencing people toward enthusiastically working toward goals that have been identified for the common good. And in the book, that's where it stops. There's a period right there. Since then, Hunter is lo learning and growing, and he's added the phrase, with character that inspires confidence. With character that inspires confidence. Uh, character, what do we mean by character? Somebody said character is the person you are in the dark when nobody's looking. That's what character is. We know that character is what we do willingly, the right thing. It's willingly doing the right thing. I look at character as our opportunity here at the University of Mary to begin to embrace those Benedictine values, 
to incorporate, incorporate those Benedictine values into our daily living. <laughs> it's interesting to note that the operative word here that Hunter is using is influence. It's not coerce, it's not force, it's not control, but it's influence. It is clear, too, that Hunter is talking about making changes because there's some goals out there that people strive toward, and he says enthusiastically. So it seems to me we're talking about building relationships here. So simply put, servant leadership is about getting things done through people who do it willingly because you, as a servant leader, have empowered them. You have empowered them. When working to accomplish the agreed to vision, there will always be skills involved. And at Mary, we believe that leadership skills are teachable, that they are teachable. I want to begin by addressing two very specific skills. One is the intention to accomplish the task, and the second is building relationships. Let me tell you a story that I think will help us see how important these two skills are. This whole story comes from a book entitled, God Always Has a Plan B. Have you found that in your life? Yeah, usually I've got such great plans I tell the Lord about. Lord, you can't believe how great this will be if you make this happen. Always seems to come up with plan B. So, it seems that some American missionaries had hired a number of native workers to help them. They were carrying supplies from one village to another. Now the missionaries were possessed with this American mentality of push, hurry, and rush because they were there to get the gospel of Jesus, to get the good news out to the villages. So every day they would prod their native workers to push a little faster, to push a little harder. Finally, after three days of being pushed and rushed, the native workers sat down and they refused to move. That's it. They quit. Well, the missionaries were stunned. They couldn't imagine what had happened. What in the world's the problem, they said. It's been going great. You've been making excellent time. It is not wise to go so rapidly, said the spokesperson for the native workers. He said, we moved too fast yesterday. Now today, we must stop and we must wait here for our souls to catch up with our bodies. Clearly, the missionaries were stunned. They were so obsessed on getting the task accomplished. Efficiency was everything to them. Why? Because they were doing a great thing. There was a, this was a wonderful mission that they were about. So they were reveling in their ability to bring so many villages the good news. In the meantime, they had lost sight of the needs of those in their service. They had no respect for the difficulties that the native workers might be running into. Any relationships that might have been developed were lost because the missionaries had forgotten to listen. The truth was in the words of the workers. We must stop here and wait for our souls to catch up with our bodies. What are we talking about? We're talking about that wonderful Benedictine value of balance, of moderation. You need both going forward. You need to be very committed to the task, but you need to be very sensitive to the relationships of those with whom you live in your family, those with whom you work, perhaps in your part-time job, your full-time job, your club, whatever it might be. So for its only task and efficiency, what happens is you have less and less commitment to the vision, and less and less trust in the leadership. So you're getting it done, but you're losing a sense of the big picture, and you're losing the loyalty and the trust of those with whom you serve. <coughs> if you concentrate only on relationships, everybody feels good. It's a great touchy-feely experience. And finally, somebody's going to sit up and say, why are we here? It's got to be more than touchy-feely, yeah? It's got to be more than cookies and coffee. What, what, what's our vision? What's our purpose? The purpose has to be larger than we are. Why are we here? Servant leadership doesn't force compliance to the task. It builds consensus by listening. 
by honoring the wisdom and the input of the group or the department or the corporation. The key then to servant leadership is accomplishing the tasks at hand while building relationships. For show and tell this morning, I have a great symbol. It's called the triangle. <laughs> and at the base of the triangle is the word credibility. The right angle of the triangle is vision. And the other angle of the triangle is service. And we're thinking about servant leadership. So as we've heard, servant leadership is a relational process. It calls for interpersonal skills that are supportive to the leader's growth and development as well as that of their collaborators. How do we talk about it at Mary? We say it's knowledge and skills. We say it's embracing those Benedictine values. We say it's service. Now you're not going to hear me talking this morning about leader and follower. And I know you even, there, time to time, you'll have people talking about leadership and followership. And that's okay. Um, I've done some reading of an author um, by the name of Joseph Rost, R-O-S-T. And he puts forward the idea of leader and collaborators. Leader and collaborators. So I'm borrowing from him, and I'm going to take that approach. The reason I think that's a good approach for us to think about is because there's always more than one leader. Always more than one leader. Why? Because there's an exchange in roles between leader and collaborator. I often think about that. We come with different disciplines. You're, all, you're, you're pursuing different majors. There'll be at times that you're in a meeting and something high tech will come up. And my leader is Sister Nicole. She, for me, is the leader of high tech. If it comes to a topic of, well, maybe the sister's choir. Then the sisters look at me and I'm the leader. That happens to be my major from about, if I say 50 years ago, the students don't laugh. It's supposed to be funny. <laughs> I've learned that. I've learned that. So the point being, sometime we're the leader. Sometime we're the collaborator. But it gives credence to the notion that leadership is everywhere or it is nowhere. How many of you have seen those Russian stacking dolls? Yeah, if you take off the top stacking doll, you look, whoa, my gosh, there's another one just as gorgeous as the one I, and take off the next one and so on and so on. And there they are, and you kind of get the sense that what? The beauty is within. I take it one doll off and another doll off. So it is with leadership. So it is with leadership. Why? A good leader makes other leaders. If you're a good leader in your club, you are helping other students begin to have confidence in their leadership skills. Contrary to the myth that it's got to be your gene pool, you know, you're born a leader or not a leader, we at Mary have never espoused that. We absolutely believe that we all are called to leadership. We all have the capacity to lead. But to lead through service is a choice. It's a choice. In any organization, because of our individual differences, commitment to the vision, to action, it'll be varied. It'll be varied. Different situations call for different styles of leadership. Because of our different personalities, we have different styles of leadership. Different times call for different leaders. But the hope is to keep alive the common mission. Keep alive always the common mission. The mission at Mary has always been to serve the needs of the people in our region. That we need to keep alive, that we can't forget. And then always striving toward the vision. The vision changes, the vision changes, but the mission is who we are. So let's begin with the base of that, of the triangle, credibility. The credibility of leadership is absolutely foundational to fulfilling the vision of an organization and motivating <coughs> into service. The University of Mary, really, while we're very young as colleges and universities, just 50 years old, we are old in terms of our tradition. We're very fortunate. Benedict was born way back in 480. So in his practical guide, we all know the rule to Benedict. It's a guide for seeking God through community. The first word of that rule is what? Thank you. It's listen. Listen, Benedict says, to the words of the master with the ear of your heart. What a wonderful image. 
Listen with the ear of your heart. Mark Twain says it a good way. He's a little bit more practical. He said uh, one time uh, that we've got two ears and one mouth, and we should use them in proportion. <laughs> so you begin to find your voice as a leader by listening respectfully to what is being said and not being said, listening to your collaborators, to listen to the folks on your team or in your club, listening to the customer, to the user. For Mary, listening to the student. Hunter says that active listening requires a disciplined effort to silence all that internal conversation while we're attempting to listen to another human being. It requires sacrifice, an extension of ourselves. If you think about it, what is the most irrevocable gift you can give anyone? Your time. You can never bring it back. The most precious gift you give anyone is your time and your presence, your full attention. That's hard to do, isn't it? Because you're, you're thinking about, gee, what comes next? I wonder why, yeah. But to give your full, undivided attention is a great gift. Years back, there was a movie entitled Postcards from the Edge. I remember it for this reason. The character sent a postcard home, and on it, the postcard said, having a wonderful time, wish I were here. <laughs> wish I were here. The Buddhists teach us that the quality of presence defines the quality of life. The quality of presence determines the quality of life. So simply stated, we're talking about communication. That's what we're talking about, because communication <laughs> creates connectedness. It creates linkages. It's that kind of two-way exchange of information built on the bedrock of listening, trust, and respect. Everybody who comes to Mary takes communication courses. It's a very important skill, right along with critical thinking. These are skills that we need to be servant leaders. When you meet somebody for the first time, you know if they're, they're thinking things like, I wonder if this person is for real. I wonder if I can trust this person. Because if I can trust you, you're going to have my loyalty. You're going to have my respect. But you do that too. When you meet someone for the first time, you're thinking, is this person for real? Can I, can I trust them? So people need to believe that you hear and you understand their legitimate needs. Not every want and wish, but their legitimate needs and that you have their interest at heart. Just the question, what do you think, honors them as a collaborator and it affirms their expressed needs. There's no substitute for spending time and listening to those you serve. I remember one time one of our very respected business leaders in our state uh, addressed a group of our freshmen in the Emerging Leaders Academy. And he was going on and on, and all of a sudden he stopped and he said, who, or he asked, I should say, who are you and where are you going? Until you can answer those two questions, who are you and where are you going, you won't tap the depth of your great talents and gifts. So as you listen to others, you indeed are learning who they are. You're learning their needs. But guess what? You're also learning something about yourself. Because how else do we learn about ourselves and who we are, except as it's reflected back to us? So you, you come in touch with your gifts and your strengths. You come in touch with your flaws and, and your limitations, your possibilities for your future. So servant leadership in practice is personal development. They're one and the same. Personal development, servant leadership, they are one and the same. You begin to learn and you, you get excited about the fact, hey, I'm changing, I'm growing. You also learn a very important thing, and that is you can't change others. You can't change others. I remember one time one of our students coming to me. She was so excited. She showed me the ring, and she said, he's perfect except for. And I said, stop right there. You better like the except for, because you're not going to change it. 
And she looked at me kind of funny, and I said, no, no. I said, let me share that with you. You cannot change your honey bunch. What can you do? You can lighten the burdens of another. You can create an environment for behavioral change and accountability. You can model the values that are very important to you of hospitality and respect, community. You can walk the talk. And in that, you clarify expectations for others, and you set standards of performance. But you and I don't change others. But the good news is we can change ourselves. Isn't that fantastic? We can change ourselves. So leadership, it's a process. It's a learning experience. It's not a position. It's not a title. There's this anecdote told about a board of directors that just named a new CEO. And just before he went out to meet those who were his company, they said to him, we can give you the crown, but we can't make you king. We can give you the crown, but we can't make you king. What were they telling him? They were telling him that he had to gain his own authority. And he could do it through sacrifice and service. You begin to gain credibility. You begin to gain the trust of those through the ways and the manner in which you serve others. But it's your collaborators, it's the others, it's your students who make you the leader. They make you the leader. It's not your title, it's not your office. We can give you the crown, but we can't make you king. Jim Cousins, who's um, uh, quite an authority in leadership, has been to Bismarck a couple of times. He has an essay entitled Finding Your Voice in a book entitled uh, Insights on Leadership. And he tells about an encounter with a group of managers who said to him that you can learn to be a good manager, but you cannot learn to be a good leader. Not possible to teach good, strong leadership skills. And he was not happy with that response. And he said to this group, what do you base that on? They said, well, look around. How many effective leaderships, leaders are there? So he said, OK, OK. What are the qualities of a leader that are not teachable? And here are the kinds of things they shouted out. Soul, <coughs> spirit, it's inside yourself. Ethics, your value system, your wisdom, your intuition. They said, leaders do things right. I'm sorry, managers do things right. Leaders do the right things. So people observe, and they respond to what we are. Kuzis and his colleague, Barry Posner, have been collaborating on leadership research for well over 20 years. So I'm going to quote them. They said, we keep rediscovering that credibility is the foundation of leadership. It's been reinforced so often that we've come to refer to it as the first law of leadership. People won't believe the message if they don't believe in the messenger. People don't follow your technique. They follow you, your message, and your embodiment of that message. So leadership credibility is the base of the triangle because it's foundational to your ability to set the direction or the vision in your own life or for your organization, or for our university. It's foundational because it begins with you. And that's why in our mission statement of the University of Mary, if you remember reading it, we're, we're concerned about your self-direction, your self-initiative, and your self-actualization. So the role of the servant leader then is to create a climate that is open and responsive to the needs of those served open and responsive to the needs of those served. That builds credibility through listening. We're going to go to the second touchstone, vision. The servant leader takes that next step. Greenleaf called it practicing foresight. I like to use the word vision or envisioning, but he, he said practicing foresight. Hunter expands that idea by saying that the leader must be committed, and he includes the distinction between being involved and being committed. The next time you go to Denny's and you order breakfast, think of this. You order eggs and bacon. The chicken was involved. That poor pig was committed. 
That's the difference. <laughs> so commitment, actually, when you think about commitment in our, in our day and age, and I, you know, I'm always saddened when I have to say that, but commitment isn't well received today, is it? We're in a throwaway society. So for someone to be truly committed, it's almost, it's, it's almost countercultural. We have an addiction to doing what's convenient. Convenience is everything for us. Commitment, true commitment, says Hunter, is a vision. It's a vision about individual or group or a team growth along with continuous improvement. I like to say it's calling us to stretch. Your vision for yourself is calling you to step out of your comfort zone. As you think about this experience here at Mary and what it's preparing you for, that's your vision. It takes the leader and collaborator then striving together to always be and do better. It's raising the bar, moving to new levels of quality. So we're talking about commitment to a vision of what you're becoming. Ken Blanchard used this, little, used this little phrase, and I like it a lot. He says, the vision is your preferred picture of the future. Your vision is your preferred picture of the future. Lorreen Matusik is another name that I bring forward. She was with the Kellogg Foundation for a lot of words, years. And, and here's her idea about communicating the vision. She says, I liken it to a ship that's thoroughly cleaned and oiled and polished but it has no destination. A manager can take care of the maintenance, but you need a captain to set the direction. A leader must know and have this ability to communicate visionary possibilities. So vision becomes a catalytic force. It becomes an organizing principle that establishes where you are at this point of history and where you're headed. In 2001, when the University of Mary announced its vision of becoming America's leadership university, we knew we weren't there. We knew that we had to have a plan and steps to go forward to attain that vision. It was a bold step. We made promise. We made a promise to you and to your parents. And we said, if you come to Mary, we are going to give you experiences that will prepare you for leadership. Why did we put so much emphasis on servant leadership. It was an acknowledgement of the dream of the sisters. It was our founders and our sponsors who really came up with that idea originally. They envisioned a school that would be a community, a faith community, that would prepare students to be leaders in the service of truth. Here's what they said, all students are encouraged to seek the truth, to see themselves as whole and unique individuals responsible to God and to become leaders in the service of truth. Surely the most dramatic and challenging illustration we have of that, and we're thinking about it as we move into Holy Week, is Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. When you think about that, at the last meal with his disciples, Jesus picks up a basin of water, and he kneels down, and he starts to wash the feet of his friends, of his disciples. At that instant, at that instant, the world's order of things turned upside down. That pyramid with the CEO on top turned upside down. Jesus was saying, that isn't how leadership works. The shock wasn't in the washing of the feet. Of course, they washed feet because people didn't have wheels in those days. I mean, everybody was walking. That wasn't the shock. The shock was in who did it. The shock was in who took up the towel and the basin of water. And here's what Jesus said. Do you understand what I've done? You call me your teacher and Lord, and you should, because that is who I am. And if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should do the same for each other. I've set the example, and you should do for each other exactly what I have done for you. I've set the example. What was Jesus telling us? To do nice things for each other? maybe start up a curriculum of good works. I don't think so. I think Jesus was inviting us to become leaders in the service of truth. I think he was saying, let go 
Let go of your self-serving demands. Remove the masks that hide our real selves and serve each other as Jesus did, with hospitality, with humility, and with deep respect for the other. The icon of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples invites us to consider new things, new ways of living our values, of letting go of our need to control, of respecting differences in each other. Motivated by love, our life in this faith life has that balance between prayer and service, has respect for differences, extends hospitality, and thrives in community. Servant leaders are concerned with their organization's purpose, values, future, and we say big picture or vision. Remember that famous hockey player, Gretzky, the great one. He always used to say, I skate to where the puck is going to be. I skate to where the puck is going to be. How is such clarity of vision possible and what compels people to buy into it? Ed Schaefer, who was then governor of North Dakota, in a public address in Medora, said this, I want to tell a story. When I was six years old, I remember standing at my father's side on this beautiful bluff overlooking us here. My father gazed over the land and he said, there is too much here to be lost. This is too important for North Dakota to let it go. I kind of shuffled over to the edge, and I looked down, and I said, there's nothing here. <laughs> the governor concluded, Medora stands today as a tribute to a man with a vision, someone who can see things where others cannot. That man, of course, we know was Harold Schaefer, <laughs> for whom our leadership center is named. I like one other insight to this conversation, a French-American writer who said, we don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. Harold was an entrepreneur. Everything that he saw had possibility. When we believe and see something and when we act on that belief and that vision, things will happen. It's leading with the conviction of our dreams. Some years back, I received a card in the mail from a friend, and the, on the card it said, dreams come a size too big so we can grow into them. We are growing into the dream of our sisters. The University of Mary does not take community for granted, because to prepare leaders in the service of truth, we need each other. We can't do it alone. In a world of natural disasters and violent outbreaks and human deprivation, we can never lose faith in each other. <laughs> Another, I think, wonderful authority on leadership, Margaret Wheatley, suggests that when we are together, more becomes possible. When we're together, more joy is available. We need to learn how to, how to grow together. And really, when you think about it, that is the essential work of the servant leader building community. The essential work of the servant leader is building community. Here I think are ingredients for building community, and you'll notice that really it's just another way of looking at those three touchstones. Number one, commitment to each other. Leaders know their collaborators, why? Because they've listened to them. Mutual trust comes from the credibility of the leader, the loyalty of the collaborator, and positive work-related ethical attitudes. It's based on integrity, on credibility. Second, commitment to the common vision. All the people in the organization know the vision and they can tell the story. And that gives them the staying power, the commitment to go forward. They've heard that story many, many times. Third is the commitment to getting things done, the action, the service. So by responding to volunteers or collaborators' needs and concerns, then the goals are implemented, the common good is served. So we've talked about credibility. We've talked about vision. That third touchstone of service. 
I like very much what uh, Mark Twain once said. He said, when all is said and done, there's a lot more said than done. <laughs> Who's going to do it? Who's going to be out there leading the way as servant leader, as servant leader? The servant leader influences and empowers others to serve by making them excited about what's to come, the realization of the vision. I bring before to you, I think, a stunning example. Nelson Mandela, a name again in our own time. Nelson Mandela was born in South Africa in 1918. He grew up with the expectation that he was going to do what his family had always done, herd cattle. But when he was 12 years old, his father died, and he became a ward of the tribal chief. And that was an amazing an experience for him. It was an awakening. That was the first time he realized that there was such a thing as a leader, a leader. And it was the first time he realized how desperate his people were in terms of struggling for freedom. It was the first time he realized that the government was oppressing non-whites. And that awareness motivated him to go to law school. After he graduated from the University of South Africa, he was determined to become a change agent and he thought he could best do it as an attorney. What was Mandela challenging? What was his vision? What kind of action did he see himself taking? Here's what he said. He said, I have fought against white domination. I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony with equal opportunity. It is an ideal for which I live and an ideal which I hope to achieve. But if needs be, it's an ideal for which I am prepared to die. Nelson Mandela didn't die, but he was thrown into prison. And he could have died there. He was imprisoned for 20 years. But he was so impassioned about freedom for his people that in very quiet, subtle ways, he continued to give hope to his people. As a prisoner, as a prisoner, he led his people subtly and covertly. In 1986, the apartheid government felt enough pressure to begin secret talks with Mandela. Those discussions eventually after, eventually after time led to the dismantling of the apartheid government and Mandela's release in 1990. Exemplary leaders cultivate the service and the assistance of all those who are needed to make the project work. Nelson Mandela could never have done what he accomplished by himself. He encouraged collaboration. He enabled others as a prisoner to act in leadership roles at their particular level of responsibility. How do you know, indeed, if you are a servant leader? The best test of servant leadership, I think, comes from Robert Greenleaf himself. And I like very much the way he said it. It's all questions. And here are the questions we can ask our, ourselves. Do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier and wiser and freer and more autonomous and more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Every day, you and I are growing into leadership through service. Although we may not all be born leaders, we are all called to serve with credibility and vision and to take action in a collaborative spirit. The journey has its twists and its turns, its moments of frustration and despair. Uh, Catherine E. Nelson tells her story like this. I went on a search to become a leader, and I searched high and low. I sought to inspire confidence 
But the crowd responded with, why should we trust you? I postured, and I assumed the look of leadership with a countenance that glowed with confidence and pride. But many passed me by, and they never even noticed my air of elegance. I ran ahead of the others, pointing the way to new heights. I demonstrated that I knew the route to greatness. And then I looked, and I was all alone. What should I do, I wondered. I've tried hard, and I've used all I know. And I sat down, and I thought a long time. And then I listened. I listened to the voices around me, and I heard what the group was trying to accomplish. So I rolled up my sleeves, and I started to work. And as I worked, I asked, are we all together in what we want and what we think we should do and how we're going to get the job done? And then we fought together and we fought together and we struggled <laughs> to our goal. And I found myself encouraging the faint-hearted and I sought the ideas of those too shy to speak out. And I taught those who had little skill and I praised those who worked hard. And when our task was completed, one of the group turned to me and said, this would not have happened without your leadership. And at first I said, I didn't lead. I just, I just worked with the rest. And then I understood. Leadership is not a goal. It is a way of reaching a goal. I lead best when I help others to go where they've decided, where we've decided to go. I lead best when I help others to use themselves creatively. I lead best when I forget about myself as a leader and I focus on the group, their needs and their goals. To lead is to serve, it's to give, it's to achieve together. And in the words of one of our own students from here at the University of Mary, when you consciously sacrifice yourself or your interests to aid in the success of others, you are the one that becomes successful. The incredible thing is, you weren't seeking that success. I think that might be servant leadership. You've been very kind. I thank you so much.